Thanks for joining us. It's always nice to meet a guest that's got something to say and knows how to say it and is a businessman and a personality and a talent and a multimillionaire and a very clever man. John Myers, how are you? That's about six out of seven there. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you the one that was wrong. But it was... <laughs> but what are you, first of all? Are you a personality and a talent or are you a very shrewd businessman? Um, I'm probably a, uh, a businessman that l- likes to get on the air and muck about a bit and just... Uh, you know, just chat about the stuff we like. You know, there's a there's a real loss of personalities on the air right now. So when I go on, I just can't do this. You know, forty second link. Uh, the reason is uh, I don't know what to say in forty seconds. Uh, I can't do those uh, what they call crunch and roll links. I'm not quite sure what it means to be honest with you. Um, but I do links that will go on until they're finished. <laughs> you know, and they're often more entertaining. <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning because, I mean, you're one of nine. And where, where I feel an affinity with you is that you, you left school with virtually no qualifications, certainly no journalism degree or media degree or uh, TV presenting or anything like that. This is something you've crafted through your life. Has this ever been a problem for you? Um, it wasn't the problem getting into the BBC because they wanted someone who lived close who would do all the stuff they didn't want to do, like <laughs> reclaiming tape and, uh, and going to OBs in uh, far-flung places of Cumbria that no one else wanted to go to. So I did all the shifts that nobody wanted. So no one asked me if I was qualified. They just said, thank God you're here. Um, but I, I never got a job by going for a BBC board because when I filled in the BBC board form that said, uh, put your qualifications down here, it was always blank. Um, so I, I never, I never got a job through a BBC board. I never got a job ever through a demo tape, um, which is amazing. So how did you get on, John? Well, um, I got on through really tenacity, hard work, and being uh, what I would say to all students these days is being annoyingly persistent. So I, I think that really helped, and also being thick-skinned enough that when people say you're not very good is to remember it for about two seconds. And then, of course, there's a point where you go from gamekeeper to poacher and poacher to gamekeeper. Being the boss is an advantage because you've only got to tell yourself off. Yeah, well, actually, there's a very famous passage in the book where I talk about uh, when I went to Lord Century in the North East. And I went there as John Myers, as the managing director, and I thought, well, now's a good time to change my name because no one had ever heard of me. And I remember this guy in California called Robert W. Morgan. And he had this great jingle that used to go, um, it's ten past eight in the Morgan. I went, that's the man for me. <laughs> so I nicked his name and I launched on the air in, uh, as John Morgan. But I was also the managing director as John Myers. Now, I can actually recommend this to every budding broadcaster because people used to ring me to complain about me. And uh, <laughs> I used to answer my own complaints, you know. So I'd say to people, you know, what did he say this morning? Look, I never heard it, but it should be a shoe and you'll get a right bollocking. And, uh, <laughs> and that used to placate them a lot, you know. The interesting thing about you was your timing. It was impeccable. And there's a certain serendipity with your career that you'd gone from being the talent and you'd built your persona on air and you'd got that in the bag. And then suddenly all these licenses became available. Do you agree that your timing was just perfect? Because if I wanted to do it today, there wouldn't be the licenses to get to be able to sell on. Yeah, I mean, timing is everything. So timing was good. Um, And I've also, throughout all of my career, always knew when was the right time to change. So I knew... Um, when it was the right time to move from Radio Cumbria. And that's when I was caught in the back of the BBC Land Rover with a lady in a compromising position. <laughs> I knew then my time was limited. That would so, be a sun headline these days, <laughs> wouldn't it? Would be sun headline. <laughs> I remember I, t- I took this young lady to, uh, in those days, it was, they were called um, transmission tests. So before you went out on an outside broadcast, the tech op would drive to this far-flung place in Cumbria and just make sure you can get a signal. And I took my new girlfriend there and, uh, and I was waiting for base to come back and check they could get a signal. And I did, of course, what all young lads do naturally. And we were having a good conversation in the back. And uh, they blurted out <laughs> on the squawk box, Hello, John. Have you got it up yet? <laughs> and I had to confirm I did indeed. And the, the signal was perfect. Uh, so but you could I, say you went from base to second base. So I went from base to second base. Well, I did the full rounder. <laughs> Uh, so I went from that and I thought, time to move on. So, um, but, you know, uh, so the timing was right. Then I went to Red Rose, which was, um, I, I said, a sent demo tape. But I never once got a job, um, you know, through a demo. And I sent it to a lovely man called Keith Macklin, sadly no longer with us. A wonderful man, but a terrible PD. 
and uh, I sent him the tape and he sent me it back and uh, to this day I always used to never allow my PDs to send letters back like this and he said dear John thank you so much indeed for your wonderful tape however you're not quite right for the, our station at the moment but we will keep your name on file that classic last line which <laughs> everyone knows of the file in the corner of the room with the called bin and so uh, I, I was so upset by it because I really wanted to work for Red Rose and um, I thought I'd better listen back to this tape just see where I'm going wrong you know so I listened back and it was a blank tape I'd actually sent the great <laughs> Keith Macklin a blank tape and then it dawned on me he hadn't even listened to it so <laughs> I rang him up to give him a right bollocking, you know, uh, about, you know, treating young people who want to get in the industry like this. And I rang him up when his PA was a lady called Innes Bracegirdle. And she clearly wasn't... That's a comedy name. That didn't exist, did no, it? No, that's why I remember her name. <laughs> Innes said, hello, Miss Bracegirdle. I went, sorry, am I through to Radio 4's <laughs> comedy club? Um, but anyway, that's a real name. Can you imagine, I wouldn't guess you married into that name. Can you imagine that? That would have been a deal breaker for me. Uh, but anyway, she'd, um, she thought there's no way she's taking the blame for this. So she put me straight through to the legend that is Keith Macklin, who, of course, I had him on the ropes in the first two minutes. And he said, look, John, why don't you come down and see me? I thought, it's amazing this, isn't it? I wanted to get to this point of seeing him which is why I sent him the tape. But he was seeing me, not because I was any good, but because I'd sent him a blank tape. And so you're right, the timing <laughs> was impeccable. And when I went down there, I wanted to play the hits. That's all I wanted to do. And yet the only job he gave me was presenting the country show. You know, that, that has followed me around my life forever. I can't get rid of it. So timing is everything. You're right. I want to talk to you about you being a manager because well, you were the first boss I had who was an inspiration. You don't mind taking the piss. You don't mind annoying other people. And I'd never come across a boss like that before you that sort of saw how silly the business is. You always sort of keep it in perspective, don't you? Yeah, listen, as I keep saying to people, we aren't doing open heart surgery here, right? Which is the title of the book. It's only radio. I used to say to people when they were all falling about, you know, it's a disaster. I used to say, will you all sober up? <laughs> it's only radio. <laughs> you know, no one's dying, for goodness sake. And I said, listen, we want to go out and we want to do the best radio we can do, right? But no one dies. So if we make a mistake, it's not good, but it's not a disaster. Um, and, you know, I, I used to read these self-help uh, publications. You know, they used to, used to buy everything, these management books. And let me save all of these listeners right now a fortune. They're rubbish. I mean, I read one which said that you can believe you can be anything. You know, well, let me tell you, if you, I could believe right now... <laughs> wonderful things but if you <laughs> collapse with a heart attack right now as much as i love you there's no way i could do open heart surgery on the cobble streets of nottingham so you know but what what the, what they were saying is is that if you have uh, positiveness is much better than being negative and i believe if you really believe you can then you usually will and so I used to go about saying, listen, it's fantastic being on the air. It's a real privilege to be on there. Enjoy it, you know, but no one's dying. So let's just keep it all into perspective. And so, uh, and I've also got this very low boredom threshold. And I used to go into meetings to say, what is the reason I am here in this meeting? <laughs> is it to make a decision? Uh, now, John, we want to uh, fill you in. I'll tell you, I'll come back when you need a decision because that's what my job means. I make decisions. I'm not here to chat. So, you know, you're right. I used to, um, I used to manage it well. I used to let managers get on with it. Um, I used to allow my stations to be slightly different, whether it was Scotland, Wales or whatever, you know, do it the way you think. And I wanted my managers to be entrepreneurial in the way that they did it. So, yes, you could all have the same name, you could all have the same ethos, but they were all slightly different, you know. And also, the best managers I had were all slightly barking mad. As an 18-year-old working for you, it seemed pretty simple what you did that you're now heralded for as a genius. I mean, Jeremy Vine talks about you in this book as the most powerful man in radio, and I think he's probably right. All you did was put good people on the radio and they came. It's, it's really not that complicated, is it? No, it's not too difficult. The reason it's difficult is because most of the industry has a lot of dumb managers, right, who are often promoted above their competence, and then they're not given the power to make decisions, right? So there's a difference between managers and directors, right? Managers usually manage what they're being told to do, 
right? So, I mean, it's not everywhere, but that's usually the case. So program directors direct what's going on, but program managers often do what the directors told them to do. Now, the world is full of brands. You have to, it's like uh, Radio McDonald's. You, know, you do it this way and that way. And I really fear for the loss of personalities. Now, that does not mean that radio is better or worse today than it was in the 70s or 80s. It just means it's different. And the people who are getting into radio today, this will be their golden years, as I'm sure in 20 years' time. They'll say, well, remember those days in 2012 when we all had to do this? You know, And there'll be some amazing stories. But what I'm saying is that the decade that I grew up in and, and the 30 years I've been in the industry, um, I, I wanted people on the air that I would personally like to listen to. And uh, even today, you know, I like most PDs, we skip the songs. I just want to hear what goes on between the records. And I used to say to my jocks, I don't mind you dropping a song. I used to drive people mad this. I used to say, John, we want to get 12 songs in. I said, no, hang on. The reason I'm paying that guy a fortune through the glass is I want him to say some things, you know, amuse us. Now, if he drops the song, Phil Collins, and replaces it, say, with content that is unique because we've never heard it before, that's much better than a Phil Collins song, surely. There's a great responsibility with that, though. I remember when I worked for you, you said, feel free to drop the news if you've got a good enough call, but if you make the wrong choice, I'll fire you. There's an empowerment there, but there's also a threat, isn't there? You've got to get it right. There's a judgment. Yeah, I, I don't think you said I'd fire you. I think you might have said you'd get us to be a bollocking, you know. No, I think uh, you said you'd fire us. <laughs> did I? Well, probably your case, I was right. Um, no, but what it was, it was, it was, a, it was saying to people... I had used to have this argument about news on the hour, right? And I used to get people say to me, John, you're a minute late on the news. I said, hang on a minute, my nine o'clock news is the nine o'clock news, whether it's at five past nine or nine o'clock, isn't it? I don't have any other news. The fact is, <laughs> I might put the nine o'clock news bulletin out at five past nine. Okay, as long as I tell the listener it's five past nine. So I used to come on and say, hey, we're a bit late with the news today. I'm really sorry about that. The world's crazy. You know, we're having a lot of fun this morning, but he's the nine o'clock news, but we're slightly late with it. The listeners get it. You know, I've never had a complaint ringing up. Well, that's outrageous, John. I missed the nine o'clock news this morning because you were one minute late. I've never had that complaint. What I've had complaints about is I was really enjoying that and you went for the news. I mean, the, I used to talk about, I was talking to this guy in BBC Local Radio. I says, what amazes me in BBC Local Radio, I could be listening to this really good debate. And suddenly the guy or the lady will say, oh, great, that's really interesting. Can you just hang on? We're going to go in for the traffic. I'm going, go for the traffic. And they'd go for the traffic. And the traffic guy would say, nothing happening today. But they'd still do 40 seconds, tell you that there's nothing happening. All I'm saying is, I wouldn't want to, be, to run that sort of radio station because I'd be bored. Heaven forbid anyone had put me on the air and said, right, John, you've got to do a 16-second link between these two songs because it's a crunch and roll. I wouldn't know how to do that sort of radio. That doesn't mean to say I'm past it. What it means is that when I'm on the air, and if I'm hiring presenters on the air, I want them to do certain things. Now, the, the absolute trick of a great PD is putting the right presenter in the right slot. Now, what usually happens is you can't have personality followed by personality. The Radio 2 do this brilliantly. They have Chris Evans, don't they, in the morning doing fantastic. And then the mid-morning guy comes on and he's got the uh, fabulous you know, music game and stuff like that, and very music intensive. Then you've got Jeremy Vine. And it's this ebb and flow of a radio station. And I actually think that you, know, um, you could turn a radio station, no matter how badly it's performing, stick personalities on there, talk about the area you're talking about, and I used to th always think that successful radio stations were really successful if they gave the impression they couldn't give a toss what was happening outside of their area. The alternative opinion to that, though, and I've heard this before, is that if you bring people in who do big business for you, when they leave, you're fucked. Well, it is, but um, the fact is that all PD should have the person that they're going to put in that place, you know. I mean, take Scotty McClue. Scotty McClue was a phenomenon on the air, right? He was brilliant. But we all knew that that style of phoning would last three years in that market. Uh, you know, there's only too, too many times you can go on and say all single mothers should be housed in the Isle of Man, you know, which is his topic, you know, <laughs> one of his many topics. Everyone knew it was bonkers. So you have three years of this wonderful uh, entertaining phoning. Then he'd move to another market and he'd go to another market. And that was great. But your job as PD is to think, well, who could replace him? And how do you evolve the radio station? Who'd ever thought... 
You take Terry Wogan at Radio 2, the greatest communicator of all time. Who'd ever thought that Chris Evans would come on there and get a bigger audience than the great man himself? So it can be done. I think the two are different, though. I mean, with the late-night phone-in, I had lots of tweets yesterday saying, ask Myers about late-night phone-ins, where have they all gone? It, it's interesting, that's where I started my career, working with Adrian Allen, Scotty McClue, all these big personalities, most of which you employed, who are now not working in radio. It's really sad. It is. I, w I think, and I've said this on my own blog many times, the biggest opportunity for commercial radio right now is late-night. I mean, if Chris Moyles is rumoured to come back and do 10 to 1, that will seriously affect commercial radio because it is a personality on the air when no station's got any personality anywhere. And if I was running commercial radio now, I would find a great late night phone in. And I actually, what I might do if I was on the air now, I would hire five separate late night phone ins and put them on Monday to Friday. You know, so uh, Monday I might have you, Tuesday I might have Adrian Allen, Wednesday um, I might have someone else. I might have a different one every night. But the whole ethos of a late night phone, and you can do it differently. And the, and, the, and the skill these days is matching that up with the modern world of Facebook and Twitter. And, and people used to ring radio stations because they wanted to be a star. Now people ring radio stations because they want to communicate with that presenter. And so it's very important that you would have a personality on. Um, and in commercial radio, it has to be very different to BBC Local. So the commercial guy, you have to ring because you uh, want to take him on about his opinion. The BBC Local Radio take the other tack, where we all share our opinions and we come to a view of life. Uh, that's, they do that very well, but it's not where commercial radio has to sit because it'll never win an audience by doing that. Where's the next John Myers who's brave enough to hire five guys who could get them in trouble? Because let's face it, they do bring a risk. Stanage people like that can cause you problems and financially, potentially bankrupt you. Yeah, well, it's, you know, we aren't saying employ idiots. You know, we are saying employ presenters who are going to walk I don't think any of those are idiots, but they are risky and they do from time to time cock up and get you a fine, don't they? Yeah, but they do. So what? I used to have a budget for fines. You know, uh, I used to have a, my own budget. It was the fine budget. And I think we had 10 grand a year in it, you know. And, at, uh, and what we didn't get fined, we all went out for a staff night out, you know. So uh, if you budget for it and say, listen, um, we now live in a world where people love to complain. We're now in a world where people enjoy getting this radio station into trouble, right? That's fine. But the really successful presenters on the air today or even over the last 20 30 years are successful because they had a manager who protected their backs what we don't have now is the quality of the management and it's really interesting because i never used to tell my presenters about complaints and there's a, a story in the book i talk about where um uh, a, a guy who used to said, John, we've had a complaint about you. I said, oh, really? I said, do you, do you agree with the complaint? He went, no. I said, what the fuck are you telling me for then? I'm the talent. I said, you know, <laughs> your job as a manager is to manage crap like that. Yeah. You know, but all you've done there is put a thought in my head that I need to be a little safer. Now, if you don't believe in that, why tell me about it? So... Uh, and I used to have uh, presenters, you know, working with Simo. We'd never tell them about the uh, the, the, the complaints because we didn't we didn't agree with them. But sometimes, if I felt that the complainant had a view, I said, you know, he's got a point there. I would pull the presenter in and say, listen, had a comment yesterday. I think there's some merit in this. Let's have a talk about it, you know. And I'd say, when you go on air, so in future, I wouldn't say don't say it. I'd say in future, just shape the phrase this way. Rather than, rather than do it that way. Let's talk about you as a manager. Did anybody ever take you in and say back off a bit? Because let's be real about it. Trouble at the top did prove that people were in fear of you. And I remember when you walked into 106, I was about the only one that survived. I think two of us survived. As much as people love you for being direct and straight down the line and telling them how your vision should be portrayed on air, people are going to be scared of you, frightened of you and intimidated by you. Are you aware of that? Uh, I am, but I don't care about it. Uh, to be honest, because I don't actually go out of my way to be rude or offensive to people. But sometimes people don't take the hint. So you have to then be <laughs> blunt. You know, so uh, the fact is, I'm running a multi-million pound business. 
people have invested millions into this business. And so while I'll try and be nice and move things on, eventually you do have to be blunt. Uh, but I don't ever believe I'm rude. I will say, listen, I'm sorry, but um, there isn't a role for you going forward. And there's that, that famous scene in Trouble at the Top with a religious advisor, you know, which I, I talk about in detail uh, in the book. But I think that, um, uh, you know, I don't know any successful person anywhere who hasn't made a few people grumpy along the way with their decisions and what I would say is um, I'm going to be tough with you I'm going to say things you might not like but I'm going to tell you myself I'm not going to get you my, I'm not going to get my PA to tell you I'm not going to get my uh, one of my managers to tell you I will tell you myself and that's the way that I would like to be treated it's a tragedy for radio that you're no longer doing what you did I know you still do your radio show on a Sunday and, and that's fine but Surely there has to be a place for John Myers somewhere in a boardroom where you can say all this and actually be able to implement it. Is there a future for that? Or, frankly, have you done what you wanted to do and you're happy to walk away and be John Myers the star? Um, I don't think there's a radio group really wants someone like me saying, hey, do you know something? You might have got that wrong, you know, uh, because... I'm no longer personally invested in it, um, and so they've got to make their own decisions. And to be honest with you, I'm slightly getting too old to understand the modern music of side of uh, you know the Capitals. I could, I never ever uh, knew anything about music, never once. And I used to say, I you know what I know about music, you could write on a postage stamp. So I used to try and hire people who did know a lot more about music than I did and trust their judgment. And if they got it wrong, I'd get someone else. You know, they, they, I didn't understand that. Um, but what I did know was about the mechanics of how to make a clock work and was about saying to presenters, uh, if you've got, say, six presenters, three are the reason you're going to be successful. The other three will give you hours. They'll stop people tuning in. So th I always say there's two types of presenters. There's the presenters that people tune in for and there's a presenter that will keep those people locked in. Equally just as important. But it's like the porcelain and the cups and saucers, right? You still want them. Um, and so it's about saying to a presenter, I'm going to put you in this slot because I think you're going to be the very best people we have to keep that audience going to this next junction. And as long as you tell people that's their job, they understand it. When Capital Networked, they famously said that they hadn't got 30 presenters good enough to do that slot, so they chose one and networked it. I think that's probably right, by the way. I, I, you know, I think Ashley has been vilified for that, but I do actually think, you know, if you listen to all the radio stations on the dial, you cannot say that the stations that are on the air now are worse. They are professionally presented in a much better way. I think radio is in a difficult place right now where there's those, the big groups, and the rest of them who are ultimately going to fade away. I can't see how they can survive, and having seen the business plan of many of them, there's, there's little or no money to be made, and therefore what's the point? Uh, I think if they deliver local information, I think they'll survive. But it is when these small stations start saying, listen, let's play more music, and doing less local content, that's when I think they'll be compared to the other station down the dial. But if they deliver content that local people want, there is a place for them. With a radio station, you say to yourself, what, um, what is my USP? So I would often go into a radio station and I would pull the programmer in or I'd pull the boss in and say, right, what is so unique about this station? I'm going to start an advertising campaign on Monday. They go, yeah. What am I saying on that advertising campaign that is so different, so unique to us, that they can only get it on this station? And this blank look would often come across people, and they'd say, eh, our music, no, no, you, get, you can get the music anyway. So I can't promote that. I can't say we've got the best music, because they all say that. Um, well, we do news, well, lots of people do local news. All right, so I can't put that on the poster. And it's a great exercise to go through. And I actually think if your radio stations pull the people in, and you said to them, we're putting a poster out, big poster, centre of the town. It's going to be 100 foot wide. What am I going to put on that people would say, that is Station X? And it's usually a personality. Or it is, you're the only local station in town. Five Live promotes sport. Talk Sport promotes sport. Radio 2 promote the personalities, the big names. Radio 1's big about the music. What is unique about you? 
and you have to find that and understand what it is in order for you to promote the reason why people should sample you and when I launched Century I used to say let's have a great breakfast show let's have something unique at midday do we do the sports phone in and have we got a nutter on at night and if you have all that then generally you're not going to go far wrong you know especially if you provided it's not a secret because one of the worst things that radio stations do is don't fund a decent marketing campaign are those days going to come back is this cyclical will it come back where they'll bring late night phone is they'll bring big personalities is there going to be the budgets again and the bosses who can handle them if, if I was running commercial radio now, big group, I would put a late night phone in on now because I actually think the timing's right. We've got 300 TV channels, but nothing's on. How many times do you go through Sky TV at night and you go, there's nothing on? Um, there's nothing on past 10 o'clock because even ITV have merged to save costs. So all the big programs finish now at 10 o'clock. Um, and so you go on the dial, you say, what is there? Well, there's wall-to-wall music. Radio 1 have gone narrow with their music. Radio 2 have even gone to their narrow. Uh, BBC Local Radio about to start a network show. Um, what is unique? You could be the most unique radio station at 10 o'clock, and actually for low risk. Um, if you've just got a manager with a set of balls or someone who is to turn around and say, I am going to protect my late night guy as much as I can protect them. Uh, and I'm, but the important thing is put a producer on who actually knows what they're talking about. Finally, before we go, I want to talk about the affirmation of John Myers. And I think it started when you got the government request to go in and analyse radio. And then they came back, the BBC, and said, could you do it for Radio 1, 2 and BBC Local Radio? W- was that the moment when you thought, I've made it? I'm obviously there. People want to know my opinion. My opinion counts. No, I'll tell you what that was. That was the moment when all my life I've been saying, surely they're going to find me out one day. Surely they'll realise I've been getting away with it for 30 years. And then you get a call saying, John, you've got away with it for that long. Come and do the BBC. And, um, And I actually went in. A lot of people thought I should have been harder, but I actually liked what the BBC were doing. I just thought they could do it in a slightly smarter way. So you went into the BBC and you told them what you thought. What reaction did you get when you were going around? Was there somewhat sort of hesitation as to whether you were going to say close the whole thing down? Um, I think there was, you know, going in good grip, what's he going to say? Um, But actually, the staff were brilliant. The staff welcomed me in with open arms. Um, When my report came out and said there was 50% too too many managers, there's still 50% too many managers, you know. And uh, I I understood it was like asking turkeys to vote for Christmas, you know. It was never going to happen. But they can do it on less, uh, fewer suits um, and keeping the content on the ground. But they do need people, I think, to allow their presenters to wander off and just talk about life at times. It seems as if DQF has failed because all that happened was they offered people redundancy and those who wanted to take the package took it and those who were smart enough to stay and keep taking their wage were able to stay. Is BBC Local Radio, do you think, a better place in the last year? Because this is the year when they were meant to turn it around. Um, I think it's going to be a better place in the next couple of years because now all the risk has gone, now all the threats have gone. The opportunity now is for BBC Local to do the news, do the content that they're known for, but make sure they bring in people who can communicate. The real skill of a radio station is anchored on those who can tell a story with a turn of phrase or a slightly different use of the English language. These are the people we gel and work towards, and these will be, I think, the future of BBC Local. I adore BBC Local Radio, and to me, when it's at its best, it's using people like Bernie Keith and Toby Foster and these characters that epitomise where they live. And, of course, in the North East, John Myers would fit in perfectly well. Would you be tempted back to do a daily show? I know you like going to Spain and places. Could, could they tempt you? I would, I would do a daily show on BBC Local tomorrow. No one's ever asked. Um, but, uh, and yeah, listen, I'd love it. Uh, but also, I'm not so sure... Uh, I wouldn't be in the manager's office on the naughty table every day because I said the odd comment that made listeners go, oh, I don't know if I like that. I mean, Alan Bezik, the greatest phone-in jock in the country, who's not allowed to do the phones because he might say something that is not very BBC. 
And there's a station that really needs to build its audience. And the first thing I would do is say to Alan, you're going to finish at 10 because your last hour is going to be on the phones. But I do think the BBC will hopefully um, improve now. Um, and they're doing very well. Seven million is not to be sniffed at. I, my goal would be I could get you 10 million listeners in two years from now, and I can do it without... I think, a lot of trouble by believing and trusting the talent. That's where I would say, trust the talent to get you there. So to make this happen, then we need you control of English regions, speak to somebody above. I mean, I know they've got other things on their mind at the minute, just very quickly on the Savile scandal. You've been involved in scandals, nothing on that scale. Is it best to mayor corpus straight away when something goes wrong and put your hands up? Or is it best to sort of go quiet and hope that it goes away? It's amazing. I feel sort of um, let down because in 30 years I'd never heard a thing about Jimmy Savile. Never heard anything. I just didn't, you know, um, work in those circles where I came across Jimmy Savile. So when it all came out, it's all been like, wow, really, you know. But what I'm more offended by are the people, not the people who say they heard rumours, but those people who said they saw something and didn't try harder. Those are the people I think have to ask themselves, wow, you know, did I really do the right thing at the right time? And who knows of the BBC? Uh, the guy's dead. We'll never know for sure. But the hundreds of people who are coming forward would suggest that the BBC have a case to answer to. But I do think everyone's beating the BBC up. Hey, this is not just a BBC problem. This was ITV, uh, who had all these pop shows on a weekend, who are uh, uh, all part of this generation. The newspaper industry could have revealed Savile's problems and issues donkeys years ago. Why did they stay all quiet? I absolutely agree, but there is a question about my tribute program on Radio 2 last Christmas Day. If there were questions about who he was, as we now know, should that have ever gone out? There is a legitimate question to be asked at the top. If they knew, why did they tribute a man who, at very least, had a dodgy background? Yeah, I mean, I think if someone came up to me as manager and said, hey, John, just to let you know, your weekend schedule may have to change, my follow-on question might, would be, why? And I guess that's an answer that's still yet to be fully explained. You've got an amazing life now where people want to talk to you and who knows what will happen next. You know, I really I don't have a plan. Uh, and that's the great thing about it. You know, I just think, uh, I fancy doing that, so I'll do that. And then we'll see how long that goes and then I might do that. You know, but... Yeah, I'm enjoying this period. This is really fun, you know. I mean, I now know how the wanted must feel like when <laughs> they go around radio stations. I've not had any groupies uh, following me around. Any groupies? Uh, or any groupies. <laughs> but there's time. There is time. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying it. And you know, the reason I wrote the book, I had, um, I had a, an eight-week gap in the diary. I thought, what am I going to do for eight weeks, you know? So I thought, I know, I'll write the book. And so um, I always wanted to write it. And uh, I do so many of these after-dinner bits that people say, John, you've got to write the book, you know. So the stories are brilliant. And so I found six weeks, and I just knocked it out in six weeks and decided to give all the profits uh, to charity. And the response has been tremendous, you know. So I'm just enjoying this part of it. Who knows where this will go afterwards? But you never know. There might be a space for a new DG soon. Who knows? <laughs> My final question has to be this. The brands that you created, GMG that you oversaw, the team that you employed is about to change. How do you feel about that? Do you think it's going to go from strength to strength? Or do you, in a way, wish that the Century brand was still there? Or is that just living in the past? No, it's just living in the past. You know, uh, if you buy a new car, you can drive as fast as you like, can't you? You know, so you, someone's bought the product and they can drive it in any direction, in any way they want. Good luck to them. They've paid the money. They deserve to do it. I'm really, I'm not sentimental. I'm just sentimental about stuff that I'm currently involved in. And uh, I look back and think, well, you know, some of those decisions I wouldn't have done, but that was me. Uh, they're running it for their own business reasons and good on them. I just think that it's very important that people who have contributed to a radio station for so long are treated properly. And so far, um, from what I can see, that seems to be the case. Thank you for your time and talking to me. Of all the people I've worked for, you're the biggest personality I've ever met in management. Uh, you're the most talented presenter of any management I've met. And to have a manager who's actually been on the air and gets it is so rare. And I think 
that's why amongst presenters you're so loved. Congratulations on the new book. It's out now. You can get it on Amazon and at your website again, which is myersmedia.co.uk. Just a tenner. Very good. And it's for charity as well, so you're not even making money out of it. No, I'm not. Shame. When I see how many we're selling now, I might have changed my mind. <laughs> why, by the way, are you staying in a premier lodge when you could be in a Malmaison? I like the beds here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I've got comfy beds. <laughs> John Myers, thank you. Thank you very much.